Good evening, everyone. I know that you've already sat down and begun your meal, and that's great. It's my um, privilege to just offer a, a brief prayer uh, of thanks for what you are eating. So as always, we begin our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious God, yours is the earth and its fullness, the world and all its peoples. We are grateful to have been brought together here tonight to feed not just our bodies, but our minds and our spirits. Continue to grace us with all the gifts that you offer, the food that we eat, the friendship that we share, the intellect that you have entrusted to us. Keep us mindful, of course, of those who are hungry, or in need of friends, or who struggle, especially in war and any of the natural disasters that affect our world. Bless to all of those who teach us about your presence, especially in nature. Give us open minds and hearts for all the truth that you want us to know so that we might come to love you and know you. And as always, we join our voices together and bless this food as we say, bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening to everyone in Zoom land also. Um, I just want to uh, welcome everybody. Thanks uh, for everyone coming out. This is a, a, a terrific um, turnout for this event. Uh, my name is Steve Jesh. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics. Um, and I'm also a faculty representative of the Society for Catholic Scientists, who you may or you may not know anything about. Um, so I, I'm going to say a few words about what that is. Um, but first of all, um, give, I want to just uh, have a couple of thanks. So first of all, I'd um, like to thank uh, Cornell Catholic for celebrating the Gold Mass um, and for graciously welcoming uh, the SCS and COLUS uh, to bring this lecture um, to your Wednesday night dinner. So that's really terrific. So thank you for that. Um, so, um, so I just want to tell you uh, briefly what the Society for Catholic Sciences is. So. Um, we have really four organizing goals. So one is is to practice fellowship. I guess what we're doing tonight is is fellowship amongst uh, Catholics um, who are scientists. Um, but really, I, I think the biggest thing that we do is to give witness to the harmony between science and faith. Um, we also provide a forum for discussion and offer educational resources, which is really most of that stuff is available on the website. So catholicscientist.org. Um, so if you are interested, if this sounds like something that you're interested in, you'd like to, to participate a little bit more, um, we have a, a, a mailing list. Um, we just started a Slack channel, um, which, you know, which is my first foray into that. So I'm, I'm, I try to stay away from that as much as possible. Anyway, so um, I have a, a sign-up sheet over here on this table, so I kind of borrowing a little sliver of the colas table over there. Um, so if you could write down your name and your email, that would be really helpful for us. Um, and so you can either, and also come and talk to me tonight. Um, you can talk to Darren all over here. So he would be uh, happy to tell you a little bit about that. Um, all right, and um, now I guess I'd like to turn things over to Lizzie, who's gonna say a few words. Hi everyone, so good to see you. Um, it's a real delight and a thrill to be able to work together with two other Catholic organizations to bring this dinner and lecture together. Um, before I introduce Sister Damien, I would like to acknowledge that this event is made possible in part by Illumine, supporting the Catholic intellectual tradition on college campuses nationwide from the John Templeton Foundation. Um, so I, I am particularly delighted to welcome Sister Damien Marie back to campus. Um, I met Sister Damien Marie while working on a Colas Institute summer seminar this past June, Explorations in Integral Ecology. And Sister Damien was much beloved among the students um, for her wisdom, for her clarity of thought, 
but also her willingness to get her hands dirty. So here are some pictures from the summer, um, some fond memories, uh, spending time with Sister Damien, working at an organic farm nearby, going on the uh, scientific cruise of the lake. Um, she's just great. So I am very pleased to be able to introduce her to more Cornell students. Um, Sister Damien is a Franciscan sister of the Eucharist. Um, currently, she serves as the Dean of Science and Sustainability at Aquinas College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, before Aquinas College, she was Associate Professor and Chair of the Environmental Science and Studies Department at the University of St. Thomas, Houston. Um, Sister Damien is a civil engineer. Uh, she received a PhD in civil engineering from the Catholic University of America um, and also a BS in biogeography from McGill University. Her research interests include theology and science, ecology and theology, ecological, ecological restoration and resilience theory. Um, so please join me in welcome, welcoming Sister Demi Marie for a talk on the abolition of man, technology, and anthropology in the modern world. Can everybody hear okay? Is this okay? All right, well, thank you for that overly generous introduction, Lizzie. I, I'm just as delighted to be back here. Um, I just so enjoyed being with you and with everyone at Colas and getting the chance. I'm a lake person, so I, I loved being around the lakes here in, in um, Western New York. Of course, I have the Great Lakes in Michigan, but I had never been to the Finger Lakes before. I'd never been to Niagara Falls, so all of that was part of the summer trip, so thank you. Okay, so, and I also want to thank the Society of Catholic Scientists. I had a lovely meeting this morning with, uh, with Steve and just really enjoyed meeting him. And um, it's so delightful to see so many of you students here too. We had a lovely luncheon today. So um, I, I can only just encourage you if you're in the sciences to realize that there is such a harmony between science and faith and to know that you, you're around some really amazing people, Dr. Lenin too who are here tonight, who just understand that harmony of the two very well. So, so now tonight, I took the title of this talk from, does anybody know who wrote The Abolition of Man, the little book, The Abolition of Man? Uh, yes, C.S. Lewis, short, do you know when? <laughs> Very good, perfect, 1947, actually. So that I took this, the title from his book, and that was 75 years ago, and I think he was extremely prescient at that time, long before the age of computing and cell phones, to kind of raise a, a warning flag about where our scientific and technological obsession was leading us. Not that either of those is bad, but he, he had some concerns about it, and he raised those concerns in this little, this little book. Now, just so for, for a little bit of interest here, at that time in 1947, there were complex number calculators, which was kind of a rudimentary computer. Transistors were invented in that year, which probably is something that none of, maybe you've never even heard of transistors. Um, <laughs> And then that was followed by integrated circuits in the, the late 60s and early 70s. Then microprocessors, which were like thousands of integrated circuits on a silicon chip. And that allowed computers to become much smaller, much faster, and more widely available to the public. And then with the development of networks, that led to the internet, graphic user interfaces, the mouse, handheld devices like cell phones and such. And now we're entering the age of AI. And I saw that you have a talk coming up in March on AI. So I hope that maybe this talk will pave the way for your future um, investigations along those lines. But so C.S. Lewis was writing long before all that technology development. But he was one Catholic writer among many, and I'll mention a few tonight, that was expressing deep concern sort of over the accelerating technological power that humans were gaining. Not that he had concerns over the, the technology itself, but the power that it was according to humans. And so his contention in this little book was that 
the power that we were gaining would eventually abolish the nature of humanity itself. And so in effect, human nature ultimately would be lost in this kind of relentless conquest of nature that has characterized the modern world. So the question I have tonight is have his concerns really borne out? So I want to, in the first part of the lecture, look a little bit at his concerns and then look at, well, what can the Catholic intellectual tradition give to us that could help us answer some of those concerns that he voiced so many years ago that were so prescient for where we are today. So first I'll look at some of his, his words, his contentions, then what we call the technocratic mindset, which is sort of the mindset that has developed underlying the use of technology and how that has affected how we view ourselves. So are we losing ourselves in this process? Then the Catholic mindset and what the Catholic mindset says about the human person. Because believe it or not, we have a huge resource in the Catholic intellectual tradition. A lot of people don't realize how wealthy we are intellectually in our Catholic tradition that, can, that is willing to dialogue with almost every branch, any branch of science, AI, any discipline, arts, we, so, and all of that, we can undergird all of the, that, those pursuits with a robust understanding of the human person from our Catholic tradition. So I wanna just highlight a little bit of that might, that might help us with the question of whether we're losing ourselves in the face of the technocratic mindset. And then just finish with some images that hopefully might revivify a little bit how we can view who we are as humans. So maybe to leave you with some images that might be positive. So I want, the first part of the talk will be a little bit maybe heavy on what's happening with our human nature and are we losing it. The second part, I hope will bring you hope for who we really are and how we can approach these questions. Okay, so the abolition of man. Now this is, I was interested when I came to prepare this lecture, I was looking, just looking for some images about the abolition of man. And I came across this experiment that was done actually by an, an AI pioneer. His name was uh, Carson Grubau, and he's a cartoonist. He took sentences from the abolition of man from C.S. Lewis, put them into an AI interface, and asked the interface to develop images based upon those sentences. So these are all AI-generated images that relate to the abolition of man. So this is, this is how the title looks. And then this one here says, um, there neither is nor can be any simple increase of power on man's side. Each new power won by man is power over men as well. And so man's conquest of nature means the rule of a few hundreds of men over billions upon billions of men. That was one of C.S. Lewis's key concerns. And then he says, and that's illustrated here, each advance leaves humans weaker as well as stronger. So I just thought it was interesting that I'm doing this talk in technology and I'm just looking for a few images and I come across AI generated images of the abolition of man. And they, they claimed on the few sites that I was on that this was the first time in the history of humanity that we have a comic strip generated by AI. The image is completely generated by AI. So, and some of them actually, I did not include some of them because they're actually quite disturbing how they were generated. This just, I did not want to introduce those images here, but um, this just gives you a sense. I thought it was, it was kind of ironic because this is exactly what C.S. Lewis was a little bit concerned about or very concerned about. So for C.S. Lewis, there's a kind of boomerang effect where our, our struggle to dominate nature will re result in a situation where the power that we have will be enormously increased. And we do, those who understand technology have a huge amount of power. And the second concern he had was that those using the technology can actually affect and direct the future of humanity. And those who don't 
use or have access to the technology are subject to those persons. So I think that is an important, I guess an important warning for us, who has the technology, who has the power, and then ultimately says C.S. Lewis, the roots of human action, we will, we will lose our sense of where our human capacities come from. No longer will they be a gift that's given to us by a transcendent creator. Everything now becomes no longer given, but whatever we can create through our technology by humans. So we lose that sense of the givenness of our nature. And so he says, human nature, so I'm taking these are his exact words, human nature will be the last part of nature to surrender to man. Again, writing this in 1947, it's hard to believe how he could uh, come to this. And so finally, man's final conquest have, has proved to be the abolition of man. And that's where the title comes. So that's where C.S. Lewis is coming from. Now before, I just want to say a little bit more, because C.S. Lewis asks, well, what really is nature anyway? And he says there are varied meanings. So first, one that we think of, nature is anything physical. Usually it has a spatial, so it's, it's exists in space and time, and it's kind of a concrete thing, physical thing. That's one way of looking at nature. We tend to look at it as stuff that can be quantified, so it can be weighed and measured. In Aristotelian terms, Aristotle looked at everything as nature as four causes. Anybody know the four causes? Any philosophers in here? No? So we have a material, efficient, formal, and final. In our world today, we tend to emphasize the material and efficient causes. The material cause, so if you look at the little bowl here, the material cause is the wood from which the material is made. The, the efficient cause is the person who carved the wood, so the doer of the thing, the person who made the thing. But those aren't, and that's what we tend to emphasize in our scientific culture. But Aristotle said there's also the formal cause, so the shape of the bowl, because the wood could have been in any shape, it could have been a chair, but no, it was in the form of a bowl. And then the final cause, what do we use that for? So if we're gonna have soup or something, that's our cause. So, but today, so for Aristotle, nature was those four causes. Today, we tend to emphasize the material and efficient causes, which as you'll see in a minute, sort of X's out a metaphysical level of understanding of nature. And the other thing C.S. Lewis does is say, well, let me look, I'm, I'm not sure what nature is, let me look at the antonyms, the opposites of nature. So when we hear natural, one opposite might be artificial, another opposite might be civil or human, so the natural versus the human, or might be metaphysical, so the physical versus the metaphysical, or the supernatural. So these are kind of outside the purview of nature and our contemporary understanding. And you can see here how the formal and the final causes tend to be in a more metaphysical understanding of nature. And today, we are more caught in this sort of physical, efficient, material understanding of nature. Important because technology is going to relate to how we understand nature and how our mindset is kind of attuned today. Okay, so the technocratic mindset, what do we mean by that? Well, first, let's just ask, what is technology? And I will say this probably five times tonight, so I'm sorry if you get tired of it. Technology itself is not bad, so I really don't want to come across saying that it's bad. But the technocratic mindset is concerning. So we want to distinguish between those two. So first, I just want to say, what is technology? Now, it comes from the word techne, which is basically means art or a skill or a craft, and the way of doing something, it actually comes, it's interesting, from the word to weave or to fabricate. So, so technology has, is the, the speaking, so logos, the, the speaking or the practical application 
of knowledge to make things, to craft things. And that's, that's actually a good thing. We've done that ever since we, the, the beginning of humanity. But where we get into, so there's the, the positive side is the creativity. So technology is an opportunity for the creativity of us as humans to be expressed. I don't think there are any animals that make technology. I know that there are some elemental tools that chimps use, but no animal has, has ever made technology and distributed it the way we have on such a wide scale. So we have this tremendous creativity and intellect that allows us to do that. On the other side though, it's a double-edged sword or a double-sided coin because on the other side is the power that comes with that development of technology. And that's where the concern comes in when we speak about the technocratic mindset. Who has that power and what's, and, and there's, um, a lovely passage in Laudato Si, which is Pope Francis's encyclical on caring for creation. And he echoes C.S. Lewis and some others that I'll, I'll introduce in just a minute, a whole line of Catholic thinkers from the 1940s on who expressed some concern about the power associated with technology. And Pope Francis says, those who have the technology have an impressive dominance over the whole of humanity in the entire world. Never has humanity had such power over itself, yet nothing ensures that power will be used wisely, particularly when we consider how it is currently being used. In whose hands does all this power lie or will it eventually end up? It is extremely risky for a small part of humanity to have it. And then further, he says that there's a tendency to believe that every increase in power is actually an increase in progress, which isn't necessarily the case, right? And so the fact is, he says, that contemporary man has not been trained to use power well. Why? Because our immense technological development hasn't been accompanied by a commensurate development of human responsibility, human values, human ethics. And that's, that's sort of the crux of the whole problem, I think, with that we've run into with technology. Okay, so then the technocratic paradigm is sort of the power side of technology that was at the heart of C.S. Lewis's concerns and that we confront in so many ways today and in Laudato Si, Pope Francis calls this a technocratic paradigm. He, mentioned, he says that it's undifferentiated, it's one-dimensional, it's rather reductionistic. So we're leaving out that metaphysical half of nature and reducing it to just the physical and the material. It uh, focuses on the human subject who uses reason and logic to, to gain control over an external object. So there's this the sense of a master dominator, kind of a slavery of, that humans are imposing upon the external world. And as if the subject, as if the human were to find him or herself in the presence of something without form, so no formal cause, just completely open to manipulation. And I think we've all seen that in some of the science that is done today and some of the technology how, how it, it is approached. And this is, so this is not how we want to do it. So the technocratic mindset, now we'll hear from some, Guardini who wrote in the 1940s and 50s, the technological mind sees nature as an incense state order, a cold body of facts, an object of utility. So there's that utilitarian mindset raw material to be hammered into useful shape. So Guardini, as a philosopher, was concerned about this in his day. Thomas Merton and Dr. Lenin was just telling me that, I don't, I don't usually do a lot of reading of Thomas Merton, but he has some interesting stuff about the technological mind, so I wanted to include him in this. He has connections to Cornell because his brother came here, you said, right? And his name is on that plaque that's outside the chapel that lists those who died in World War II. So if you look up Merton, there was it John? Yeah. So anyway, so I think we should we should keep keep him in mind and maybe say a prayer for him too while 
since he comes up, but Thomas Merton himself called this technocratic mindset the central problem of the modern world. It separates humans from the reality of creation and enables them to act out of their fantasies as a little autonomous God, seeing and judging everything in relation to himself. So this idea that even maybe with technology, we tend to think we're God, right? And a bunch of little gods running around. Martin Buber, so he, he wrote even earlier, I think this was in the late 1920s in his I Thou book, the great crisis is the tyranny of the proliferating it. Now he meant it as it, but I think it's a strange irony that it's also IT, right? So the, the tyranny of the proliferating IT, <laughs> uh, the world of machines, which once was intended by its inventors to be a faithful slave to our communal will, exhibits today, as it is driven by an anti-communal will, the same satanic autonomy as the magic broom and the sorcerer's apprentice. You might, you might have seen that Disney show where the, uh, the sorcerer's apprentice steals his the sorcerer's magical cap and then puts a spell on the broom and gets the broom to carry water to fill up the well, which was what the apprentice was supposed to be doing with his own sweat and tears. And instead, he got this broom to do it, but then he falls asleep and the broom just keeps doing and doing it and the whole thing floods. And when he wakes up, he can't get the spell to go off. So that's what this, he's referring to here. And he has to get the sorcerer to come and but in the meantime, there's water everywhere and he's almost drowning. So, <laughs> But that's kind of an interesting image for us to think about. Have we started this room of technology that keeps pouring and pouring and pouring and doesn't, we can't stop it. <laughs> just, just to ask ourselves these questions. And then Martin Heidegger, so a key person in, in his treatise, his question concerning technology in which he is very much in line with C.S. Lewis in saying that the threat to man doesn't come from the machines themselves or the technology. The actual threat is afflicting us in our very essence of who we are as human. And I just think it's good to see, hear, read the words of these men who are writing this all through the decades of the middle uh, 19th, 20th century. So in this dawning atomic age, so the atom had just been split, the, this technological revolution could so captivate, bewitch, dazzle, and beguile. And when I'm in the airport, I often think of that because I'm looking at everybody on all their things and I'm thinking, wow, everybody's captivate, captivated, bewitched, dazzled, and beguiled right here, <laughs> you know? And that, to the point where we might think that this kind of calculative thinking is the only way of thinking. It's not a bad way of thinking. It's a very good way of thinking. All of us in here practice that. But if we think it's the only way of thinking, that's where we get into issues, and that's where we get into this technological mindset. And then he says, when we get to that point, then man would have denied and thrown away his own special nature, that he is a meditative being. And there's something very beautiful in what he's saying, that we're a being that reflects on the meaning of things, that has a metaphysical foundation to who we are, to our very nature. And therefore, says Heidegger, the issue is the saving of man's essential nature. So that's what's at stake here. So when we use our cell phone, again, I have a cell phone and I use it probably more than I should, but I use it a lot and it is very, very useful. But we have to have, I think, some, some guidelines for the use of our technology and for the power that it gives and to know within ourselves, even individually, also as a culture, but individually, each one of us, when do I need a little bit of a fast from this technology so that I can recapture my meditative beingness? <laughs> you know, and when am I getting a little bit too caught in the in the, the power and the ease that this technology is affording to me? Okay, now we get to go a little bit more into the Catholic intellectual tradition. Pope Benedict XVI, a brilliant mind, and he, he brought up this question of the historical development of our relationship to technology in his introduction to Christianity, so way back in 1968. 
he was reading all of these other persons questioning technology. And he said, we've basically over history had three fundamental human orientations to reality. The first one in the time of St. Albert the Great, say Aquinas, St. Francis of Assisi, so I'm a Franciscan, so I have to put him in St. Bonaventure. <laughs> um, at that time, being is truth. So the, na the nature of things is, the truth of the nature of things is their beingness, right? And verum est ens. But, says Pope Benedict, when we moved into the early scientific age, so the late 17th century into the 18th century, and here he points to Kant and to an Italian named Vico, who advanced the idea that the truth is what we have made, verum quia factum. And so the, there, be, there came a radical shift in terms of how we viewed ourselves, says Pope Benedict, in that shift, because before it wasn't so anthropocentric because our being was given by God who was a supreme being, right? But now the truth is what we have made. So now suddenly everything is revolving that our nature is coming from what we have made, we humans have made. So our beingness has changed because our truth is associated with what humans have done, not necessarily what God has done. Then he says, in the more recent scientific age, truth is in what must be done in the makeability of things, faciendum of things. And that says Pope Benedict fundamentally changes our orientation to totally to the future. So her, so wait, here we go. Okay. In ancient and medieval times, it was easier to focus on the eternal because the being of things brought up questions as to where did all this come from? Our orientation was toward that. But then we went into this early scientific approach and we looked at what we have made. So their focus was on the past, what we have done. But now it's the faciendum. It directs our attention to the future of what we ourselves can create. And that's in AI, that's what we're moving into now. What can we create and how can we sort of recreate even ourselves? I'm not saying AI is bad because I think, you know, we have to, we have to look at it and it could be doing very, very many good things for us, but we have to keep it in perspective and look at it in terms of some limits to the technology itself. And so how can the Catholic mindset, how can the Catholic intellectual tradition help us with this? What does it tell us about the nature of the human person? that could help heal some of the, the sort of dissonances that are coming about, about our, our sort of ex extremely accelerating use of technology and the technocratic mindset. That's, that's sort of compromising our understanding of who we are as humans. So this is what I'd like to make a few proposals here. Now, so first I go to the Catholic catechism. So if you have a question about things, look in your catechism of the Catholic church. There's so much there and there's actually a section on technology. So if any of you want to go and check that out after this, that's a great resource. You don't have to read a tons of philosophy. We have it right in the catechism. So it says, first of all, up front that science and technology are precious resources. So they're good in themselves, but they need to be placed at the service of humans and they should be promoting the integral development. So the whole holistic development and the common good of all. So the holistic development of the human person includes of our full nature, right? So our metaphysical and our physical nature. And that's not always taken into account in our current technological development. It also emphasizes that it really is an illusion to claim that technology is morally neutral because usually there, in the applications of technology, there's some use of it that relates to an ethic of some sort, right? And so there needs to be and this goes back to what Pope Francis says in Laudato Si, we have, to we have to match the excellence that we achieve in our technology with the excellence that we have in our ethics and our understanding of our nature as humans. And that nature, so science and technology to be respectful of that nature have to be ordered to the human person. And the human person by nature has certain moral values, has certain limits and has certain purpose in life. So the technology should be 
toward the flourishing of that nature, that essential human nature. And at the service of the human person, of the rights of the human person, and in conformity with the will of God. Now that's a tough one. And we had a discussion today at lunchtime about you know, discernment. How do we discern the will of God in our own lives? We were talking about things like vocation to religious life or family or your profession. This is a bigger discernment. And is that happening in our development of technology that we're discerning that conformity to the will of God? And so here's an example. This is one of this AI generated images from C.S. Lewis's book. And it's an example where technology really isn't ordered to our good. Everything that is, looks upside down and contorted and compressed. So I think that's, that's kind of what the Catholic Catechism is referring to as an issue with this. But who are we then? And what can Genesis tell us about who we are? So I'm gonna just go back to Genesis one. So everybody is familiar with these passages. God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. And he gave them the mandate to be fertile and multiply and to fill the earth and subdue it. Now this has been, so this is our motive for technology for the, that we're given this, this, uh, this mission to, to develop the earth, to subdue the earth, but it's caused a lot of controversy. In 1967, there was an American historian, Lynn White, and he published an article that was very influential and still is today in the journal Science. It's not a scientific article, but he calls, he called it the historical roots of our ecological crisis. And in that article, he blamed Christianity in this particular passage for all of our ills, especially related to ecology because of this passage in Genesis, right? I do have to say in the end of his article, he says, the only saving redeeming grace in the Catholic church is St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> so I at least get to, I agree with him on that one. No, I'm just kidding. Not that he's the only saving grace, but I think he, he helps us to see how we could view. So maybe there's a tiny element of truth in Lynn White's claim. There may have been persons through the centuries who read that and said, well, that's my directive then to be a master dominator. However, I think he misses the biggest cause, and that is this whole technological development that occurred throughout the Enlightenment, right, that we just looked at that caused us to, to kind of re-envision who we are as humans and to focus everything on the makeability of things, right? So that's what got us into this master kind of sense of a master dominator that humans are to impose themselves on this external object, right? So we're a subjective somebody imposing ourselves on this external, very separate reality. So I'm afraid, I think he missed the boat with in not adverting to that and, and not giving the um, the full story of where that that impetus to to be kind of a master figure or to view ourselves as a master slave kind of relationship with the created world. Then in Genesis two, it says a little bit more about how we're supposed to subdue the earth, right? So we want to read scripture in context, and in this account, creation account, he says the Lord took the man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and care for it. So subduing means cultivating and caring. How do we do that? It means tilling. So tilling means, okay, because we have to eat, right? We have to have, I don't think any of us would really want to be without any technology and be out in the cold tonight, you know, with lanterns or something. I wouldn't be able to show this and maybe that would be better. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, but I think, so we, we have to use creation, right? We have to and technology helps us to do that. And technology has, in so many ways, through medicine, communications, science, technology, all of those have helped us to become who we are today and to alleviate a great deal of suffering. So we don't want to obviate that value of technology. But our way of, what, what we have to look at is how, how can we put some guides or measures around our use of technology so that we're, we're cultivating like gardeners. And when you're a gardener, you don't sit there and stomp on all your soil, right? Or you, you want to bring 
that soil into fertility. And you, and you want to care for it from year to year. So like right now at our home in Michigan, we're putting all these mulch down on our garden because we want that soil to be replenished over the winter. So how can we think of that? And I'm just posing a question because I don't have all the answers at all, but posing the question for all of us and maybe we can have some Q and A and talk about this. How do we cultivate and care in the way that we develop our technology as opposed to imposing and dominating? You know, is there, how do we get to that distinction in practice? And, and what would that mean for all of you in terms of how you, you live out your vocation to your science and technology as you move into your futures? I wanna to highlight too, as we're thinking about who we are in the Catholic intellectual tradition, we can be misguided. So Pope Francis says that we have a kind of schizophrenia between this technocratic mindset, which sees really no val intrinsic value in the natural world and thinks of everything just as an external object to be manipulated. That's on one end. But then what has evolved in our age, which is unique to our era, is this other extreme where we don't see any special value in ourselves. And I do like this comment, this comic here where, and this was not generated by AI. So. The doctor is talking to the Earth, planet Earth, right? It says, uh, the, the good news, we've got advanced stage humans, but the good news is they're just about ready to, to get rid of themselves, and so you'll be on the mend soon. So the idea is, and there, and there was even, I think it was at University of Texas, there was an ecologist who strongly advocated it, that we should, one strategy for solving the ecological crisis is basically to get rid of humans. Now, I, wanted, I wondered whether who, who the 90% of humans were to be killed off were going to be. I mean, who decides that, right? <laughs> Is it going to be one of them? I volunteer to kill myself off to save the planet. So, okay, so we have this schizophrenia. And I think that that is a hard twerk in today's day and age. So that's not how we want to view each other, neither one of those extremes. Here, for the next few slides, I'll just take a few from... What Pope Francis says, he has really has some good things to say and we're about to see about our human place. And the first thing he says is we are not God. And we're not even little godlings like Merton was worried about, right? But we can tend to think of ourselves as God and technology can tend to encourage us to think that way. We're not meant to be absolute dominators over other creatures. And we're not meant to be reduced to an object either. And the sad part I think that happens when we tend to reduce nature just to an objective reality to be manipulated, it's a lot easier in our mindset to reduce other humans to an object to be manipulated. And that unfortunately is happening, right? Like, so we, this objective view of other humans, and we, we simply can't do that. We cannot reduce ourselves to objects. At the same time, we can't reduce ourselves just to being one being among others, so a kind of equality. And that's what Lynn White was calling for in his, his article, A Democracy of Creatures. We're not on the same level of creatures. And if we think we are, the, we're, the problems are only going to get worse, right? So we have to own who we are, honestly. Now, as Franciscan, so this is, this is our little dog, Boomer, and he often gets into my slide presentation. He is not, we love Boomer, but he's not the same as us, right? And so another comment, again, not AI generated, but two dogs are in talking about their doing their taxes. And the one says, I realize how helpless and needy they are, but I'm afraid you still can't claim a human as a dependent. <laughs> so I don't, sometimes I wonder when Boomer looks at us like that, what he's actually thinking about us. But, so we can't let ourselves think that we are on this. It's just a different relationship. We love our dogs, but they're not the same as us. And finally, we're not meant to be alone. So we're communal creatures. We're meant to live in community. And we're meant, as we talked at lunch today, we're meant to discern in community too, which is something I think in today's world, it tends to be individualistic, but we simply can't go off into a corner and try to figure out all these answers. We have to talk together to discern. 
who are we? So we're created in the image and likeness of God. We're the only creature that's created in that image and out of love. So when in our scriptures, what was unique about our creation story as opposed to those at that time, the Babylonian, for example, was that their creation was not done in love. Humans are created by the ripping apart of different gods and goddesses, the fighting between them. And then Genesis came along in the Hebrew scriptures. And after every piece of creation, God said, and it was good. And, and there's a strong sense that everything was created in God's love. So we are the product of God's love, as is everything else in the natural world. We're a subject, so never view ourselves as an object. And when we do, something's off base. You know, so and we unfortunately have some situations like that that we deal with in our our culture today. We have a natural and a moral structure, so our nature is both natural, physical, and moral, metaphysical. We're capable of rising above who we are, of sacrificing, of suffering, and entering into communion with other persons. So that's critical to who we are, and we're capable of dialogue, reason, inventiveness, creativity, contemplation, science. And that's why our science is a good thing and why our technology is a good thing. It's one way that we can actually act in our image, in the image of God. And what is our unique role then? So if we are in the image and likeness of God, who are we and how does that influence then how we develop and use our technology? And in the Catholic tradition, basically, we are cooperators with God in the work of creation. So the world is unfolding, and we are assisting in that unfolding. Now, how do we do that? There's a, there's a few ways we can, we can say here. First of all, to cultivate and care for the garden of the world. So how do we do that? Cultivating, meaning bringing fruits forth from it. Caring, meaning preserving and, and taking good care of it and loving it as God loved it. A few of the fruits from our farm. So, and, and these are like sacramentals, right? Because we, we cultivate and care in that way and we're participating with God in the work of creation through that when we do it well. We also have this vocation to be meditative creatures, to contemplate creation and to, I love this term, to approach life with a serene attentiveness. And one of the young women at our lunch today said that she's a student here in philosophy and she's working on the philosophy of silence, which I thought was beautiful. That is so needed today in the face of technology and the technocratic mindset because we can get so captivated with the kind of the superficial use of technology that we don't take the time away from it for silence in which we can actually discern what the Lord wants us to do with our technologies. And we can discern what is the nature of what is our nature and what is the nature of this world around us and when are we treating it well when are we cultivating when are we caring for it well and then finally our one of our key roles is to lead all creatures back to their creator so that that we should be bringing the world with us and those we love in the world back to god with us in a greater fertility and I certainly hope, I hope I can get to heaven. When I get there, I hope I can say, well, did you see what we did in the garden? I mean, we really trans, we, we really transformed that kind of dumped the area and made it into a really fertile garden. Will you accept that, <laughs> you know, from part of my life's work? And in your science, could you say, do you see what I have done in terms of understanding how this cell works or how this, the beauty of the stars and, the, and the, the incredible complexity that's there in our cosmos. So all of that is part of this unique role that, that we have as humans that no other creature has. And so technology is part of this role. So now I will just end, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Am I okay? Um, with some images here then to leave you with some images of how we might think of ourselves as human persons. These aren't so philosophical, but images. So we're homo sapiens. That means the wise man. What do we want our wisdom to be about? In what will our wisdom consist? Question to ask all of ourselves. And I was at a reading today at Mass about wisdom. 
And a homo, human person as a mediator. So homo medi, mediates, mediator, mediatrix for the feminine. So we are this upright creature. And St. Bonaventure, the great Franciscan saint, who was a, con, a contemporary of um, St. Thomas Aquinas, spoke about the analogy of upright posture that as humans, that has a sort of spiritual meaning. We have our feet on the ground, on the earth, and yet we're able to be oriented upward because we don't have four, we're not looking down at the ground on four legs. And so we are this kind of mediator. We're in this middle position where all creation should come through us back to God. And that we don't want to be in a bent over state. We want to be in an upright state that allows creation to be mediated. And where there are, a mediator also reconciles differences. So where there are differences where there are dissonances, where there are um, things that are off base, the mediator tries to realign them. And that's what I think could be our role with technology. And so, and what we, oops, sorry. We then hope that we might emulate the mediator who is Christ. So it, as Catholics, as Christians, we would say the prime mediator is Christ. Now, I like this drawing because here we are with our upright posture, but I was thinking, I don't feel very upright sometimes. I'm always like this down, you know, with my work. So not to say there's anything bad with using a computer, but it's just sort of a funny image to think, are we going back again and losing our upright posture? But, and then we also remember too that in the Catholic faith, we have Mary, the mediatrix. So the mediatrix of all graces. So this isn't just you know, a male image of a mediator. There's, we have the both, which is a great grace in our Catholic faith. Or the human person as the gardener. And I've, this, this one, I especially like being a gardener, I guess. But, so can we think of ourselves as homo agricola? So how is a technology person? Are you a gardener? How are you tilling the soil, building up the soil, bringing forth fruit? So, and again, I don't have all the answers here, but I'm just trying to pose the questions for how we might look at this in light of our, our problems with the technocratic mindset and sort of changing that mindset along these other images that are very favorable of who we, and very accurate as to who we are as humans. God gave us the mission to be a gardener. And it's interesting that he appeared after the resurrection as a gardener, Mary Magdalene thought he was the gardener. So there's, there's something captivating about this image of the gardener. Another one, the shepherd, so homo pastor. And I love this, this photo of the shepherd carrying the sheep on his shoulders. And so this isn't being a dominator, even though it's still preserving the sort of central place of humans, but it's not in this sort of dominating anthropocentrism. It's using our technology, I guess, to, to be for others, to carry, how do we as, technology people carry the lost sheep on our shoulders. So how do we carry those who have no technology on our shoulders? How do we make it available to them? Um, we're, we're not meant to use our technology to totally eliminate suffering, which unfortunately I think is, there are some in the technocratic world who are trying to even eliminate death through technology and some impetus in AI is heading that direction. I wouldn't favor that myself. We, we, we cannot eliminate suffering, but we can help alleviate it for one another. We can be with one another like this man is with his sheep there. And, and just envisioning ourselves as the man carrying the sheep or the man going after the one lost sheep and his, his flock. And then finally, how does looking at technology from the Catholic mindset affect how we see ourselves in terms of engineers or in terms of makers? this homo faber, how, how do we see ourselves as human makers? And do we want to be, have a technocratic view of ourselves as makers or something else? What kind of makers do we want to be and what do we want to make of this world? So I think I'll, I'll stop there and hopefully we have some questions from, from those of you who are here. So thank you for bearing with me.
Schuster. Um, yeah, we now have some time for questions, so uh, feel free to raise, raise your hand. I will bring my mic to you so that the people on Zoom can also hear your question. And please don't be shy to ask questions. I'm asking them of you as much as I am of myself, and I would love to hear your perspectives um, in terms of this, this question of how do we be makers. So... And maybe say what you're studying, if you don't mind to say your name and what you're studying. Might be good. Sure, um, I'm Maria, I'm studying applied math. Um, so my question is, you can think about the analogy, for example, when people didn't know what the fire was or what the wheel was, and sort of discovering the wheel or discovering the, the fire put some people who had possession of that knowledge sort of in power over people who didn't possess that knowledge. So how do you think that the technology evolution these days is different from that? And what can we learn from how human beings evolved, sort of discovering new tools as, as time went on? Yes, okay, so excellent question. And certainly there are similarities that you're alluding to. So definitely there are similarities. A couple of things come to mind, and I probably could use more time to think on this, but one is the pace of technology development today is, is you know, much more rapidified, I would say. So there was more time for this technology of fire or the elemental tools to be taught <laughs> to, the, to the cultures, to be spread. Nowadays, it's progressing so rapidly and it's become so, I guess, technically complex too that you can't simply teach it. So my second point, I guess, would be it's not as easily teachable <laughs> because the persons who are developing it are, are like a hundred steps ahead of those who don't have it. So I think there was, I guess, the time factor and then this kind of um, spatial factor that is, is so much more compressed today. Now, on the other hand, we're much more able to communicate globally as, as we weren't able to then. So we should have the capacity to spread this more quickly now whether it could keep up with the pace of the development, I don't know. Also, the economic aspect, I think, would be huge. In fact, that there's so much money wrapped up in this, and the money and the power go together. And I don't know that that was, that wasn't, obviously wasn't part of, like, when we invented fire. It was, would have been part of some of the earlier technologies in the Industrial Revolution and such. But, so I hope that helps. Questions? So, Sister, I know that you're working on a book right now, um, and some of this material is going to appear there. Um, I remember earlier in the day you were talking about how education is going to be part of this book, and you're thinking about um, how do we kind of make our ethics commensurate with the progress that we're making technologically. So, I wonder if you can share some of your some of your thoughts um, in that domain. Yes, so that, I hope to get to those answers by the time I finish the book. But um, So yes, I am trying to look at how would we educate for this other mindset that has, because it, in Laudato Si, Pope Francis says something like, there can be no ecology without an adequate anthropology, which to me is one of the key lines in that whole encyclical. And I could say, well, there, there could be no technology without an adequate anthropology too. So how, I guess my question for the book is then how do we educate in the way that we incorporate this adequate anthropology that's commensurate to what our technology is, is how our technology is advancing. So for one, and, and again, I'm still working on this research, but I would say we need to educate not only the head but somehow the hands and the heart too. And I know this is one of Pope Francis's or the Congregation for Education now, the Dicastery for Education uses that phrase a lot in terms of their goals of education is to educate head, hands, and heart. And so I, I would like to look at how we do that. I think in the sciences, we have a lot of possibilities there because we have laboratories, we have field work. We, you know, we, we go out and look at the stars so we're already physically getting our hands into it. And I, I actually really believe that the 
the use of our bodies in education is extremely important, especially as our bodies become more technolo technologized. <laughs> um, I think that we learn better when we're connected to something through a body experience. There's a lot of data out there that shows that. And I, we probably learned that during COVID too. I mean, you can show people in an online lab, you know, how, how to do something in the chemistry lab, but it's not the same as doing it. When you go to titrate, you can watch it all you want. And when you get down to actually doing it, it's not the same until you actually physically do it. So somehow with our engineering, we already do a lot of hands-on, but I, somehow we need to get that hands-on aspect with the anthropology harmonized. And I don't know, you know, in a place like Cornell, I, I'm more used to Catholic education. But I'd be interested here in how you feel it might be happening or not happening at Cornell. You have philosophy department, that this could be, I, I don't know if these kinds of, of anthropologies could be incorporated somewhere in the curriculum, but I think all scientists and engineers should be getting some foundation in who, what is the nature of who you are as a scientist and engineer? And what is the nature of nature? So what, so that we have to recapture, I think just the Aristotelian model, it's not a Christian model, the four causes of things, and that there is a formal cause and a final cause of everything. It's not just material causes and efficient causes. So that's, I think, one way to get it in. Also, the idea of primary and secondary causality, this could be incorporated in any classroom that when we study science, when we do technology, we're, we're doing secondary causality. That doesn't eliminate that there's a primary causality that is responsible for the being of all of this here, right? So evolution is an example of secondary causality. It doesn't mean that there was, there isn't a God who's a primary cause of the being of everything and that's holding everything into being. That was Aquinas' argument. So I think some of those simple principles and then the engagement of the heart, I guess in teaching people to care, so cultivate and care how do we care? Because I think sometimes that, that, that phenomenon of caring, which can't really be quantified, but it's an important part of education, that's what actually changes behaviors or, or that motivates us to act in particular ways. When, when you really love someone or something, you, you want to take care of it. I mean, you don't want anything to happen to it. And I don't know if, how we could get that ethic of care into all that we do in our education, that it's more than just a functional something that you're learning in the sciences. You know, and I was trying to encourage, for example, today in our conversation, students asking about, well, I'm not sure what my vocation is and if I should change my major. And where is your heart? You know, where is your passion? That is what you should go for. And I think that is what you care about. That is what will motivate you and that is what will enable you to figure out ways of doing things that are for the common good or that benefit others or that enable you to carry the sheep on your shoulders that are lost. You know, we, we need that kind of open-ended creativity, but it should be undergirded by the head, the heart and the hands somehow together. So I've given you a sneak preview of some of it, but it could go in other directions too. So thank you for the question. Does this make sense? I'd really love to hear from more of you as to whether this, this seems important to you in your education. Would you want this? <laughs> or... um, well, well, uh, <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is David. I study linguistics, so social sciences. Um, I'm wondering, a lot of your talk centered on what I think are like societal level things that we should grip, and education is definitely really important for solving those. Um, but I'm curious, uh, how do you think, you know, I guess in, in your life, how do you affect these things? You mentioned attending to the garden. Do you have any other examples? And how would we as lay people seek to, you know, tend to our own gardens, both in, I guess, the working world as engineers and scientists uh, and, you know, maybe in our personal lives as well? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. That's a beautiful question. And that's where it all starts. So I certainly had more of a focus on the big picture, but I don't, as a Franciscan, I probably should have been more focused on the 
the individual person because that's where it all starts and the formation of each one of you. That's why I would be writing about education because I think it's a formation process. So for us as Franciscans, we do, we're all very professionally active, but we do live on the land and we, we have, for example, in Michigan, I live on 230 acres and we take care of, we, we lease out some of it, but we take care of over a hundred acres. So we have gardens, we have steers, so we eat their meat, we have chickens for their eggs, we have a small orchard. So, and what I find is, you know, on the weekends, we work together on what needs to be done on the land for the most part. So there's a couple of things there that are important and they, they apply to, I think, as lay people, we work together. And there's something about the communal working together that is really transformative and you'll find this, I think, in your families too. So making sure that there is that family time together, working together as a family, whatever the project is that you, that you like to do, or whatever the experience is. And I think it's good if it's a hands-on something, because there's just something about, we're, we're embodied creatures. So we're not just meant to be only heads, you know? So I think the embodied experiences are very important as, for us as religious, they surely are, but I think for you also as, as um, lay persons, and if you go on and get married and have children, to remember that with your families. I find too that after a pretty draining week at the university with all the different tasks and administration and all of that, I, sometimes I'm thinking, oh man, I don't know if I can afford the time to go out to the garden this morning. But when I do it, I'm out there and things kind of realign inside myself. And I don't know if it's an analogy of you get kind of bent over during the week and then you get in the garden and there is something with, I don't think you're necessarily conscious of it. Sometimes you are, but those are the rhythms of the creator are in that creation, whether it's the soil or the plant or the steer that we're working with or the chicken. It's, it's not a human creation and the, the laws of, or the, the being and the love of the creator is there. And so when you touch that creation, you something reorients in you because you're getting in touch with your own being in the image and likeness of that creator. And our during the you know, our our we get warped. It's just part of our human condition, we all do. And I think something like that working in the land actually corrects that warp, you know, and, and reorients us to a more upright, sort of analogically upright position. So there's that. And then I think with technology, we all, most of our sisters have, even our elderly sisters have cell phones. I mean, we, and we communicate by them a lot. But I was, sometimes when I'm with young people, I've been recommending like a Lenten practice, just one example. And I said this at lunch too, maybe to try a technology fast. So I'm not saying don't use your technology at all during Lent, but choose a particular time to fast. So instead of, you know, giving up chocolate or something like that, which probably is also very difficult, but try giving up your uh, texting or being on your phone at particular times of the day through, through Lent. And I think you'll find that it, I don't know, I, try, I did it one year and I was amazed at how distracted I had gotten without even realizing it. And we pray three times a day. And, you know, I mean, our life is geared toward prayer and everything. But I, boy, I, when I gave up that phone after dinner, I just, I, I was so productive. I mean, so many other kind of integrations came about. And I, I first thing I realized was, wow, I've really been distracted, distracted. I haven't been able to really meditate because I've been so focused on, you know, the different things I was looking up or whatever. So I would recommend that maybe as a personal practice of kind of just try it out and see and do something that's workable for you. I'm not saying never use your technology, but sometimes take a break from it and, and then and give yourself some time. The other thing I would recommend, and I do this with all my students, maybe choose a place. And this campus is so beautiful. I, um, I just think you have such a, an amazing piece of land here. Take some time to go to a place that you really love. And I actually give this assignment to my students. So, and sit there and no, no technology. You can bring a journal if you want 
and just sit there for whatever time period. I ask my students to do an hour, which I know is a lot. One hour and just, you can jot down some thoughts, what comes to mind and just give yourself that experience. And I'm amazed when I read their journals, some of them will say, I've, I've received this response a number of times. Oh, I was, I must admit, I was annoyed that you gave us this assignment. I couldn't figure out why do I have to sit here for an hour and write down something. But then you see as the journal entries go on throughout the semester, ooh, he's starting to observe, he's starting to see something here in this little plot where he passed over it before and said, oh, there's nothing here. Why am I sitting here? Suddenly starting to see something, starting to reflect on something, starting to make analogies. Gee, you know, there's this big pile of junk over here. I wonder what's a pile of junk in my life right now that I need to clean up or, you know, just that kind of thing. And I think those simple practices, so I'm speaking as a Franciscan, hopefully a simple, a humble Franciscan, um, but I think those kind of simple practices are ways that we can counter the mindset that creeps in, that technocratic mindset. And um, you, I, and I think our generation, we were, we're susceptible to it now, but we didn't grow up with it. So you have more that you're trying to counter. So you might need some more of these practices to introduce into your life. And of course, prayer is another one. And I understand there's mass here almost every day of the week. So if you're, if you're a Catholic, go to mass. I mean, the sacraments are the ultimate incarnational reality that puts us in touch. And that's the counter, the ultimate counter to you know, a totally disembodied technocratic mindset. So give yourself to those sacraments. So thank you for that question. It's a great one. Sister, Sister thank, thank you so much for um, this great talk, these great reminders. Um, and I know for myself, this will prompt a lot of uh, reflection um, over Thanksgiving break, perhaps in the car, as we use technology, um, <laughs> about how we use the, the tools of our research and how we can use our research to become ever more human. Um, so please join me in thanking Sister Damien. Darren, do you want to share a couple announcements? Thank you, Lizzie, and thank you, Sister Damien, for the wonderful talk. I also need to say thank you to Sister Damien for anticipating what I'm about to say. If you were paying attention in the beginning of her talk, she mentioned an AI symposium or an AI event coming up next semester. If you enjoyed this event, which was a collaboration between a number of Catholic organizations on campus, we have something similar coming up next semester. So in March, the Thomistic Institute on campus, the Collis Institute, and the Society of Catholic Scientists are coming together you may have seen on the slides, um, to host an AI symposium where we're bringing in a computer scientist, a philosopher, theologian, and a legal scholar to weigh in on the topic of artificial intelligence from the Catholic perspective and from each of their respective fields. So this is going to be in March. We expect it to be very interesting, and we hope that if you enjoyed this, that you'll also come and enjoy the future offerings that we have for you. So stay tuned on the Collis listserv. Stay tuned with the Society of Catholic Scientists mailing list. And yeah, we hope to see you in March and before then. Thank you. And um, just two more very, very short things. Um, our last COLIS program for the semester will be tomorrow. So it will be our last session of our non-credit course, Peratio. Um, this one will be led by Professor Jonathan Lenin on evolution and faith. I'm really excited for this one. I was chatting with Jonathan a few weeks ago. I was asking him what he, he was researching, and he said, oh, I discovered a new law of nature. <laughs> you know, there's gravitation, laws of motion, and yeah, I am proposing one having to do with evolutionary processes. Um, so come tomorrow, it's at 5 p.m. in um, B16 Rockefeller. And then um, before you leave, if you wouldn't mind uh, completing one of these brief surveys on your table, that will help us to develop um, better and better programming. You can put those surveys in the basket right outside the exit doors. And um, finally, very last thing, um, please join me in thanking uh, Kelly Soprano and the staff for making this event possible. It's a huge amount of work to put together a dinner like this. Thank you, everyone, and have a great evening.